and welcome to episode number 17 of the Classical Guitar Composers Podcast. As always, I am your host, Chris Hales, and I'm very glad to have you joining me today. If you are joining us for the first time, this is a show that features original classical guitar compositions sent in from around the globe by listeners like you. If you have written an original classical guitar composition that you would like to have featured on the show, you just simply send an mp3 recording of your piece to chris at classicalguitarcomposers.com. It's that simple, you send it to me, and I feature it on the show. And if you have any other information you'd like to send along, such as your website or information about your piece, send that with your email, and that will be shared on the show. I will also put up any relevant links on the website, www.classicalguitarcomposers.com, where the audience can find more from you. And with that, I bid you welcome, and let's get on with the show. Alright, and I have a great show for you today. We're going to be featuring music from two different composers, uh, one we have not heard from before, and then new music from a previously featured composer in another episode. So, on with the show. I thought I might just try to give everyone a break from the COVID-19 talk, so I'm not going to really talk about that at all. Um, I imagine you all would just really like to get away from that for an hour or so, so hopefully I can provide you with a little bit of a distraction, if anything. Uh, I also uh, had thought, hmm... Should I talk about Tiger King? Because I watched Tiger King, and I mean, there is lots to uh, dig into on that, but that's probably, I would imagine, you're either not interested or you're sick of that as well. So why don't we talk some guitar? (laughs) I have been playing my guitar a little more uh, recently. So beginning back in like September of last year, I think, I started to orchestrate a musical for somebody that is very nearly done and it's it's kind of at a standstill at the moment it's it's like very close to being completed as far as the orchestration but uh, anyway I've done all I can with it and so it has freed up my time to get back to more guitar playing and uh, anyway since September it has pretty much eaten up all my free time it's actually made it difficult to uh, get to get to be able to sit down and record this podcast every month. But uh, where I'm at now, it's freed up my time, and it is nice because I'm playing more guitar now, and I've dove back into some projects uh, that have been on the back burner. I mentioned in the last episode that I record these uh, concertos for... I record the accompaniment for people to play along to. I do a full orchestral recording, do the full score, and... Uh, I have not, to date, recorded any guitar concertos because I don't know that the demand for those is very high, and as much as I love classical guitar and things like this are more of a passion project, with those I'm trying to record things that, you know, are going to get a lot of uh, use. That being said, it occurred to me that um, a lot of guitarists do learn duets. Uh, I think there's some, there's a few duets out there that I think that a lot of people learn things like La Rosignol and Drury's Accords, these old Renaissance lute duets. And so I actually kind of on a whim recently, I recorded a couple of those. I, I recorded videos of me playing each part and I threw them up on my YouTube page so that if you would like to jump in and join me, uh, and play along. Both parts are recorded, so you can find whatever part you want and uh, play along. Anyway, maybe something to do. They're a little, uh, they were done in haste, and I'm pretty good with audio, but uh, not so much with video, and uh, I'm trying to get better, so I want to, I, I've only done two so far, but I did them really quickly, but I have some others that I, I'd like to slow down, actually, uh, you know, get get a really nice recording and hopefully a decent video as well. 
But if you're interested, that's something you can watch for on my YouTube channel for guitar accompaniments of, of duets. And um, feel free to use those in any way you desire. You can rip them, I don't care. They're free for you to use. They're, they're just there to be used. So uh, if you do, maybe uh, subscribe to my YouTube page. Uh, you could do that. That'd be nice. But yeah, I've been digging through uh, some books, and uh, I, I was thinking about... I've often talked about the great composers that we don't have in classical guitar, um, I, that I sometimes lament that that we just don't have music by Beethoven or Tchaikovsky or Mozart that... not much anyway. I mean, a few pieces have been transcribed, but... You know, transcriptions are just never quite the same as music that was written for the instrument. I think the lone exception would maybe be Albanus. For whatever reason, transcriptions of his works just move over to guitar beautifully. And they sound like guitar compositions. I wonder why that is. I don't know, but I, I find that interesting. But that's not to say we don't have some great composers. And um, I've been thinking about this question. Who is the greatest guitar composer and I mean guitar composer so see this would take Bach out of the equation because Bach never wrote any pieces for guitar right like talking about only people who wrote music for the guitar and I don't know I don't know what my answer would be I would probably lean toward Tedesco I just love Castle Nuovo Tedesco that's where I'd probably lean but to tell you the truth I also feel a little bit ignorant there, like, um, I was recently thinking, I need to get more into Morel. I need to study some more Morel. I've, I've liked things I've heard by Morel. I think he's a really good composer, but I've never, I don't think I've learned a single piece by him, ever, which is shameful. I can't believe I'm admitting that on, on a podcast for the world to hear, but it's true. I've never learned a Morel piece. I have some up on my shelf. I've just never dove into it. But I like him. So I wonder, you know, could he be a contender? I don't know, because I don't, I'm just not familiar enough. Uh, you know, I think some might say Villalobos. As much as I love Villalobos, I don't think he's the best. I think that Taroba has a case. I think he's probably, I think Taroba has probably wrote the the largest amount, of all, of all those guys who wrote stuff for Segovia uh, in the first half of the 20th century, I think Taroba probably wrote the most good stuff, you know, he had a lot of good stuff, a lot of stuff that Segovia never even played, that's great, anyway, that came to mind because I've seen a lot of people, uh, you know, for whatever reason, probably because they're bored right now, so, what is the definitive top five this or that, anyway, if you have a thought on that, please email me, tweet me, Whatever you'd like. I enjoy correspondence from the listeners. And with that being said, I would actually like to read some of that now. So, like I said earlier, uh, we're going to be featuring the music of two composers today. I also have a few more episodes, music-wise, lined up. So, uh, which is a very good thing. We're getting, we, <laughs> me and my staff. Uh, I am getting uh, more pieces sent in to where I actually have music for a May show and music for the June show. Still doing the once a month pacing. And uh, this is a very good thing. I'm very excited about that. So if you'd like to send in some music, please send it in. And uh, you might want to do that soon. Uh, you might want to jump in line. But you never know. It may... Uh, it may go months without any more submissions. You just never know. But I'm very excited about all this music. So that being said, the artist that we'll be featuring on the next episode, I've had a lot of emails back and forth with him, and so I'd like to read some of this. Um, so I'm going to... We'll introduce him more in the next episode when we actually feature his music. Um, but the short of it is... This is a listener in England who's fairly new to the show, and he sent me this email the other day. It says, Chris, having finally caught up with your 
casts, I have some more ramblings of my own. <laughs> First of all, some thoughts on the major minor idea. Without consulting my scores, I think most of my work is in the major. This was not deliberate, as I was entirely self-taught and simply wanted to, as Edward Elgar put it, get the music from the air, which in my case demanded to be put on paper somehow. This is not to say that I was unaware of this, but it surprises me to hear that others see minor compositions easier to realize. As I have said, I have since gained far more knowledge on the subject, which should have helped, but really stirred up and muddied my native purity. Perhaps the muddiness is beginning to settle a little. It is a truth that a podcast may well be the new mother of invention for me. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say, Martin. Uh, this gentleman's name is Martin Slater, a guitarist from the UK and composer. Just responding to that a little bit, uh, so he's talking about in the previous episode I talked about, I was just wondering if, if people are like actively trying to balance their pieces between major or minor, uh, if it comes to mind much. You gotta be kidding me, somebody's mowing their lawn. I finally got everyone out of the house, and someone's mowing their lawn outside. How inconsiderate of them. I hope that I don't know if it's coming through on the mic or not, but we're just gonna record anyway. There's nothing I can do about it right now. Anyway, uh, yeah, you know, the, um, my point was not to say that you should be aware of it, it was more of a curiosity. I'm just wondering. And uh, I told that story that I heard about um, on the local classical station about Tchaikovsky writing this, uh, I believe it was an orchestral suite, and then he realized that all of his movements were in 4-4 and he, he pulled one of them and put, a, put in like a, a waltz or something. So it's interesting. But anyway, yeah, uh, Martin says it sounds like you more favor the major and find it easier. And uh, yeah, I don't know if we took a poll of everyone who composes, you know, where that would fall. But that is definitely the consensus of my first composition teacher as well as me and um, I believe Andrew Aylward in, the, in his response to that was on that same page too. Anyway... I don't know. I don't think it matters. I mean, Mozart wrote, like, 99% of his pieces in major. So, I mean, if he can do it, <laughs> I, I think it's okay. I'm certainly not going to criticize him for that. Secondly, Martin mentions that uh, he has some relatives in my hometown of Spanish Fork, Utah. And uh, I may know one of them. It's very interesting. And what a small world, sometimes. It's not such a small town anymore. I'm actually glad I don't live there anymore. It's gotten quite large and, and I would say poorly uh, designed. <laughs> it was designed to be a small town. Anyway, Martin goes on. Third, please pass on to Parker that I am following his talks on recording methods with interest. I actually have a Cubase system, which I bought years ago along with a full piano keyboard. I do have basic keyboard skills. He wrote that in parentheses. <laughs> Man, I don't. <laughs> Not, not anymore. I actually grew up playing the piano, and uh, the only instrument that I seem to be able to put down for long periods of time is guitar. Like, like I can barely play the violin today, and I, I, I played in the orchestra in college. I was a pretty good violinist. Not, not great, but pretty good. But I, I digress. I know there should be some. Me this is Martin. Now. I know there should be some method of playing music into a program, but I have never got to grips with it. I even went to evening classes, but of course they used a different system which just confused things further. Yeah, that might. Uh, any chance I have of producing a concerto of any kind, particularly now, depends on me becoming more technophilic. Maybe you could take this as a subject with Parker? It was certainly great hearing the concerto by Mark Francis. Maybe he could enlighten us as to how this was created. Um, Mark, I believe, uh, used a live orchestra. I think he ha he he has one at his disposal. Uh so if you can do that, uh that's the best way to go, but uh I certainly don't have access to that. I will mention this to Parker. Uh although I I'm not seeing him as frequently right now, because uh, everyone's working a little more from home, but I actually talk to him quite a bit, so I will I will pass that on to him and uh he'll actually probably hear it anyway cuz he listens to this show. Now the we could we could have a discussion about that. Uh, I th actually think that's a really good idea. 
Um, someone who... Okay, I'm going to be having a guest, a different guest, on... <laughs> In October this year, because uh, I got a lot of uh, a lot of people reacted uh, to the Halloween show, and and it seemed to be something that people really enjoyed. And me being such an enthusiast for such things, uh, I want to do another Halloween episode this year, and I probably won't be writing a whole nother suite for it. But uh, no, we're gonna do something fun um, on that show, and I have a a different guest lined up for it that we're gonna have some fun but you know that's months away so that being said that particular guest would be a great person to have this discussion with parker um does have uh the experience as well with sampled instruments but he is much more of an audio guy and uh the guest i'll be having in october has years and years and years of creating accompaniment tracks with sampled instruments. Um, so if I can get him on any sooner, I actually think that would be a great uh, discussion to have and, and separately from the Halloween episode. So I'll talk to him about it. Um, I really enjoy having guests. I've, I've thought about um, having more on, but... Um, you know, it's got to be the right reason, I guess. I've thought about having my... I've thought about reaching out to my composition teacher from college and asking him, but I um, have not yet. The thing is, is uh, Parker came on just as a favor for me every time, and it was very generous of him to... I mean, it's fun. I mean, it's just us sitting and BSing, but, uh, you know, people are busy, and... Uh, yeah, I would be asking, I'm asking guests to come on for free when I'm asking them to do this, so that makes me a little reluctant, I guess. But I will talk to uh, the October guest and see if maybe he'd be interested in having that discussion. Um, actually, now that I think about it, I also um, once, I have another person uh, who I know who has a lot of experience with this and he actually uses Cubase and he has actually expressed interest on coming on this show before I totally forgot about that till now so we may be doing that soon uh, of course we'd have to be able to you know meet in the same room I don't yet have remote podcasting capabilities uh, but really quickly um, I wouldn't mind just kind of laying out you know my what I would consider the basics of this, and it probably will not solve uh, the technical difficulties for for anyone, uh, Martin or anyone else who's having those, but um, it might might give you a baseline to get started. Okay, so I'll do my best to keep this brief, but I actually do think that you guys will find this of interest, um, and I will I'll give you a demonstration when I'm done. Okay, so what we are talking about essentially is MIDI recording, and that could either be with samples or synthesized instruments. Um, so real quick, for those of you that don't know, and I realize that some of you might, but uh, please endure. MIDI is just a way of recording information into a program, a computer program, that pertains to music. So it records a couple of different points, like say when you play your keyboard into your computer. It records pitch. There's actually a number value assigned to each pitch right so there's like like middle C is pitch 60 okay so it's it's just recording like base it's turning your notes into numbers essentially and it records pitch it records velocity how hard you hit the key it records duration how long you held the note um, those basic three things and then it sends that information to an instrument that it triggers so say it's triggering a a violin it's going to send the C that you played to the violin, and that violin is going to now play a C. Um, and it all happens very quickly, hopefully, if you've got your system set up to do so. So that's the basics of it. And then, depending on the instruments that you are using with this MIDI recording, depends on, you know, some you can just do worlds with, and some are extremely limited. So I work with sampled instruments, primarily, versus a synthesized instrument. So what a sampled instrument is, is it's where they take a real instrument, let's let's say a violin, for example, 
and they, they record every single pitch on the violin. It's a very tedious process. They record every pitch played at different volumes. So they're going to take the lowest note on the violin, the G, and they're going to play a soft G. They record a slightly louder G. It depends on, you know, how thorough the person making the instrument is, but that's the idea. You could really, in theory, do as many as you want. And then, you know, the, you're going to have a loud G. In addition, you're going to have soft, medium, and loud Gs played staccato, legato, uh, tremolo, trills, all those things. So it is a ton of recording. And then what that's, that's all uh, converted into this instrument that now when you play your MIDI note and you play a middle C and you play it at medium velocity, it's going to trigger that medium loud, the medium loudness <laughs> middle C that the violinist played. And there's ways of telling it what articulate, you know, if it's staccato or legato, and that depends on the instrument you're using. So that's what sampled instruments are. So they are, in a sense, real, because they are real recordings of instruments, but it's, it's essentially like you've chopped up all these notes and then you, you use all these fragments to create music with. A synthesized instrument, on the other hand, isn't going to sound as real because it's not real. It's your computer generating a, or not necessarily a computer, like your Casio keyboard as well, whatever, that generating a sound that's like a violin, but it's not an actual recording of a violin, right? So what Martin is talking about using a cube bass, I don't know if you have sampled instruments or, or what you've got for instruments, Martin. Some uh, programs like cube bass might come with, I'm sure, some stock instruments. So what you need to do is create a track in your DAW, in Martin's case, Cubase, that uses MIDI. So most of them have a MIDI track or an instrument track. And you're probably going to want to go with the instrument track. And for most systems, in an instrument track, you would put in an instrument as an insert. So if you have let's just go with a piano you know just a, if you have a basic piano instrument you just all, all you need to do is get the MIDI to talk to that instrument and doing all that within an instrument track should work with Pro Tools if you're using a MIDI track you input your MIDI into that track and then it sends that information to it sends it to wherever your instrument is being hosted and other than that there's not much to it as far as getting it to work um, Getting it to sound good is just depends on how your instrument works and how it reacts, and that's, you know, they're all different. So, I use uh, a couple of different libraries, but for my orchestra, I use the East West uh, Symphonic Orchestra, the Platinum Orchestra. That's been my favorite of everything I've used, and I've used a lot of different sample libraries. It's not cheap, but I think it has. A pretty dang good amount of stuff to work with and so with sampled instruments uh, they're gonna sound more real than a synthesized instruments however they're a lot harder to work with they're harder to get to that point point. and what I think the biggest mistake that most people make when they're trying to make decent tracks is this I think that they feel like they have to play it in and that's the performance and with MIDI you don't have to do it at all with MIDI you could just draw it all in with a pencil you wouldn't you could technically not even use a keyboard but what I do is I, I play it in and then I edit the crap out of it after. That would be a multi-episode thing to cover all the ins and outs of, of how to make a sampled orchestra sound good. But I would like to have a conversation along those lines uh, in the future. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you, Martin. So that's the basics of it. And I'll show you an example of what I'm talking about. So here is a recording of a Mozart violin concerto that I've done and I'll just play some of that solo part on my guitar here and you can kind of see what we're talking about.
Okay, so that's a track. That's just a little excerpt of a track I've made for accompaniment. And the whole point of this is that you could do this with your own compositions, right? So that's that's why I think this is worth bringing up on this show. And um, I know I, did, I barely touched the surface because I think this would be better done with a guest, especially because I don't put things into words very well like this. But that give you an idea of, of what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, if you write a guitar concerto, you know, it might be uh, something you w want to look into is, is learning to do some of this. I would certainly like to hear something like that on our show. <laughs> okay, moving on. There's actually still more of this email. I uh, got a little sidetracked there. But uh, he says, Fourth, yes, I have also read Dune. I am particularly into sci-fi and fantasy. Loads of books from the 70s. Also talking of horror, my nephew is currently living in St. Louis with his fiance, a Miss Poe. Yes, she is a relative of the said Edgar Allan Poe. That's pretty cool. Also, are you aware that they are attempting another Dune movie? I'm really excited about this. I mean, we'll see how it goes. It's yet to be done well, but uh, the cast is very intriguing. At least the ones I know. I like the choice of casting for Lady Jessica. Rebecca Ferguson, she was fantastic in Doctor Sleep, even though it was a terrible movie. She was amazing. Javier Bardem is Stilgar. There's some really good stuff. Parker is very upset about the casting of Duncan Idaho, Jason Momoa. He's really unhappy about it, and he says that it's basically like one step removed from casting The Rock as Duncan Idaho. <laughs> I, I don't know. If, I, I know who Jason Momoa is, but he, he's from like Aquaman and Game of Thrones. I, I haven't seen either of those. So I don't know if he's a good actor or not, but uh, that's Parker's assessment. <laughs> he's one He's one step away from being The Rock. Martin continues. Lastly, for now, never give up on your podcast. Uh, thank you so much, Martin, uh, for the music we're going to hear in the future as well as just your interaction i think it adds a lot to the show to have uh some correspondence with the listeners i really like having these conversations uh there's more email back and forth but then i like to you know if you email me i'm going to email you back but uh i like to read the emails on the show and i i feel like it adds to the show so with that i think uh Let's take a break and then move on to the music portion of the show. Hey, like me, are you addicted to sheet music? Then let me tell you about Encoda. Encoda is an app that lets you practice, play, and perform your sheet music. It is a streaming service similar to Netflix and Spotify with tens of thousands of titles. That's millions of pages of sheet music available instantly at your fingertips. Subscribers have access to the finest editions from Boozy and Hawks, Baron Ryder, Chester, Novello, and many, many more. And they have received praise from Sir Simon Rattle and Joyce D. Donato. And if you're not sure, you can sign up for a free trial. Download Encoda from your app store today. That's Encoda, N-K-O-D-A. And be sure to let them know that the Classical Guitar Composers podcast sent you. You know, mentioning those uh, duets that a lot of us learn, and a lot of them come from the Renaissance era, I, I think that... Um, you know, I've mentioned a lot that I lament that we don't have a lot of composers, but you know, one thing we get in guitar that you don't get in a lot of other instruments is the Renaissance period, because we have all that incredible loop music to pull from, and most of it translates to guitar pretty well. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's something that's more, you know, when you're talking about the standard uh, instruments of choice, that's something pretty unique to guitar. Singers have a lot of repertoire from the renaissance era as well but that's pretty much it i think singers and guitarists slash lutenists and there's probably some other obscure instruments in there too but uh you know i can tell you that there's not a lot of uh keyboard repertoire coming from there so there's something to be happy about and i am i love the renaissance music i love uh guitar pieces from there you know what though i cannot deal with that with that tuning where uh that <laughs> A lot of stuff's tuned to with the the G string to F sharp. I can't do it. I can do uh, the open tuning we use for a lot of Granados and Albanas pieces with the the A down to G, and then you have drop D. 
but for some reason I cannot stand tuning down that G string to an F sharp. I just, I won't do it. <laughs> I just won't do it. If I can learn the piece in standard tuning, I will, but if, if I can't, then I'm not going to learn that piece. It sounds cool, I just, for whatever reason, I can't wrap my brain around it. Anyway, moving on to the whole purpose of this show. <laughs> it is time now to get yourself a nice tea. If you need to pause, please do so. Get yourself a nice tea or whatever you'd like to uh, drink or eat or whatever as we enjoy some classical guitar works from around the world. All right, our first piece today is by Freya Shaw. Freya writes, Hello, my name is Freya, and I am a 19-year-old visually impaired artist from England. I have been listening to your show for a while now, and I want to share my first piece with you and your listeners. I have always adored the sounds of the nylon string guitar. From classical to flamenco, I've always found it enchanting. It's like an entire orchestra in your hands. I recently began to write compositions on my Rodriguez guitar and took the opportunity to work alongside my wonderful friend Eleanor to produce this piece in her home studio. I aimed to compose a piece which represented my ideal happy place, the soundtrack for a feeling of relaxation and safety. I have always felt like I've been able to hear colors in music. Some call this synesthesia. <laughs> I don't know if I'm saying that right. Synesthesia. Synesthesia a condition in which someone may commonly experience colors in music, people, sounds, numbers, letters, and even textures and tastes. I believe there are various forms of synesthesia, but this is the most common. The artist Kandinsky is probably one of the most well-known synesthetes. I wanted to use instruments and sounds in my piece, which symbolize the colors of a grassland, near a stream and by a woodland, teeming with brightly colored birds and people. This to me is an image of a calm and beautiful environment. My guitar, played higher up the neck in a gentle picking pattern, reminds me of the color green, the color of nature and gentleness. The different picking patterns illustrate the sleepy stream passing by. The track also features the use of a melodica played by Eleanor. The sound and tone of this instrument has always reminded me of the rustic colors of red, orange, and yellow, much like the color of the sun and the flowers. The bell-like sounds, heard toward the end of the piece, performed by Eleanor, appear light shining blue to me, similar to reflections dancing on the water. Finally, we created a soundscape of this marvelous environment with birdsong, the sound of a stream, and talking. For a finishing touch, we added the audio of someone walking from the left of your ear to the right. I hope you enjoy my work, and I wish to continue making more music and soundscapes. Thank you, Freya. I am very much looking forward to this. Uh, this is definitely something a little different. And I uh, wrote back to Freya regarding this idea of seeing in color, um, or excuse me, hearing in color. There was a bass player named Roy Husky Jr. who was said to have that ability. And the great bluegrass artist Sam Bush, he wrote a song about Roy and, uh, you know, he sings about hearing the colors in it. And it's a great song. I love Sam Bush. Um, anyway, so that's really interesting because that uh, previously had been the only time I had heard of anything like that. So thank you so much, Freya, for sharing that with us and letting us get to know you better. And, and I think it adds a lot to your piece to know, to know that background. So without further ado, this is called Greenland by Freya Shaw. Thank you. 
just heard the piece Greenland by Freya Shaw. Thank you, Freya. If you do some more uh, composing and recording in the future, I'd certainly love to feature you again. Okay, and now, as I said earlier, we are going to be featuring two artists today. So I'm going to jump back to an email I got back in February. Um, so Andrew Aylward was featured in episode six originally, and then I featured him again a few episodes ago. Uh, we just re-aired that piece he had written in a an email and, and we had some interaction. I didn't have any submissions that month, so played him again. And then right after that episode, uh, right after I recorded that episode, he actually sent in some new music. So we are going to be featuring Andrew again. So back in February, Andrew wrote, Chris, hi, just a follow-up from my email below. If you are looking for some music for a future episode, attached are three small duets that I wrote for two guitars. All three started out as exercises. The first piece was an exercise for writing in two voices for solo guitar. After deciding that it would sound better to fill out the harmonies to give a little more depth, I arranged it for two guitars when it became unplayable on one. The second and third pieces started out on the piano. The second was a study in modulating to closely, re to closely related keys and the third, a study in syncopation. Since my piano technique leaves a little to be desired, I decided to arrange both of them for two guitars and record the set of three with the teacher that I have been studying guitar with for the last 15 years or so. He's playing guitar one, and I am playing guitar two. If anyone is interested in the scores or audio files, they can be found at, and he uh, gave me some links, which I will of course put up on the classicalguitarcomposers.com website. So. Thank you so much, Andrew. I am looking forward to these, and I'm very glad to have you featured again on the show. And without further ado, here are three duets for two guitars by Andrew Aylward.
All right, and there we have it. That will wrap up another episode of the Classical Guitar Composers Podcast. I would like to thank you all for listening. I'd like to thank Freya Shaw and Andrew Aylward for contributing music to this episode. I, I still have a part of that recording from Parker and mine last conversation that uh, I did not air on the podcast, and I still plan to include it in an episode at some point, but today was not that day because for the first time in a long time, I had a quiet enough house to record, and maybe next time when my house is really noisy, I'll just insert that conversation in. <laughs> Until next time, thank you for joining me, and it is definitely rough out there right now, and I guess all I can say is, keep on plucking.